first kind of starting point here is I wanted to go back to overview about what Anode is, you know, how we bring this feed onto the blockchain and a little bit about, I guess, yeah, ANU and then um, QNG itself and, and yeah, then over to a show. So, I mean, effectively, API 3 believes that actually there is an API connectivity problem that exists in Web3. Due to the way that blockchains hash and find consensus, it's near impossible to, to add an API request into that blockchain, into the smart contract function, without effectively causing some major problems with that protocol. So that's why oracles exist. The original Oracle problem outlines that you need to kind of decentralize a feed, and which is very true, but we also think that the way that you do that and achieve that has some room for improvement. And that's a, a segue into um, an introduction of AirNode. So AirNode is how we basically connect APIs and turn them into things that can be requested by a smart contract function. It's a, it's a blockchain Oracle, but it's a very lightweight blockchain Oracle that's open source. And it's very easy to deploy to API endpoints. Once it's deployed, it's set and forget. It's completely free for providers to use. And this is kind of what we're calling uh, a first party Oracle solution. Moving on to an overview of API 3 QNG. So it's actually a feed that AirNode has been deployed to from a, uh, a division of the Australian National University's public body known as the Quantum Optics Division. These folks have been operating out of a lab on the campus for, I think, about 10 years. They have consistently and reliably served um, quantumly generated randomness through an API um, for, for, I think it's three or four years now, perhaps longer. And they, they refer to this as AN, sorry, AQN, which is short for Australian National University's Quantum Numbers. Now, I mean, yeah, if you, if you may be a little bit perplexed by what quantum randomness is, effectively, it leans into quantum phenomena and um, relies on fluctuations within the, the atoms of the world. I'm not a scientist myself. Aaron would normally kind of talk about this in more detail to, to kind of randomly generate an output. That output is measured and served through the API. Within the community, within the scientific community, quantumly generated randomness is referred to as true randomness because the, the outcome of that you know, event within those atoms is defined as uncertain, or as uncertain as, it, as something could be. Um, and yeah, Aaron is from the ANU um, quantum randomness team. They've been fantastic to work with, and um, they're, they're the folks that deployed AirNode. So, Moving on and introducing um, you know, API 3 QNG, as you may have guessed, AirNode was deployed to the AQN API, making that data available to decentralized applications. We were referring to this as API 3 QNG. QNG uses the request response protocol to, to basically serve that data from the AirNode deployed to the AQN API and bring that data on chain as per requested, which you'll see in Ashar's summary to this. We chose to deploy this as a public utility. The only cost that it takes to, for, for builders to, to access it is a sponsor wallet for gas. As you can see, we've deployed this to 13 blockchain protocols. It's fully permissionless. To access it, all you need to do is to go into the docs, follow the guides, which is all very, it's been designed to be as easy as possible. And um, you'll, you'll be able to request this within any smart contract function that you wish to. And I guess, you know, a little bit about, you know, what's coming next. We will be looking at additional QNG providers. We'll probably be, look, well, we, not anytime soon, but we'll be looking for, to deploy to additional chains. And then as, as AirNode is upgraded, the QNG will feel the benefits of those additional functions within AirNode as well. And that's it. Just a very quick um, link to the docs here at the end and um, yeah if you're if you are using this feed within uh, any projects please do share with us we'd love to hear from you if there's anything that we can do to support you um, as well from a from a kind of technical perspective a show is the guy to go to um, and that's all over to a shot all right so 
we have a very basic uh, remix open in our browser uh, we can basically start off by defining the solidity version so pragma solidity uh, 0.8.14 and then we just need to import uh, a couple of uh, contracts the first one is the open zeppelin ownable contract i think everyone's familiar with that uh, then is the nft uh, erc721 contract by open zeppelin so this is for minting nfts and then finally this is our rrp requester contract uh, you need this contract to specify that your contract would be making requests to your nodes so once you have those three imports all you need to do is you need to create the contract itself so contract let's call it random character is and let's refer to all three of our imports so ownable and rrp requester review and that's it so now we have our contract we need to specify some functions and some variables specifically what we want to do is we want to mint a character so we can go ahead and create a struct that will mint a character so so this is the structure of the character itself what all attributes the character will contain and we'll set these attributes randomly via qrng so let's define a struct of character and let's give it a strength attribute an intelligence attribute and a name okay so now that we have our struct we can go ahead and create an array of characters so let's create an array of characters so each nft would be pushed into this array so this is this is our array of characters and now now most of the nft part is done um now we need to define things that will help us call the qrng node so first we need to specify the address of the qrng node uh, we will specify and save it in this variable called air node uh, we need an endpoint id i will get into what an endpoint id is um, for now we just know that we need an endpoint id and we need a sponsor wallet again i'll get into what a sponsor wallet is but for for qrng basically you need these three things sorry so now that we have these th things defined th these will help us make the request to the air node but for these requests to keep track of these requests we need certain mappings so these mappings will help us keep track of the request so the first mapping we need is uh, a boolean mapping that maps the request id to a boolean so you do a boolean mapping and so this this mapping basically tells us if the qrng request that we made is it true or false has it been fulfilled or not so we can call it expecting request id to be fulfilled so that's our boolean mapping that tells us that whether a request that we made is it fulfilled or is it not fulfilled um then we need two more additional mappings of uh, the first mapping is uh it tells us the who who made the actual request so we map the uh 
request to the person making the request and so that's an address mapping so this is like a request to requester mapping right um so basically we just need these two mappings for now and uh, we can now go ahead and start actually writing our functions uh, we need a constructor that calls uh, RRP requester and ERC721. So this is our constructor. Now the constructor will accept uh, one argument and that argument is going to be the address of the AirNode RRP contract. Um, I will get into what this is as well, but for now, just know that we need the address of the Airnode RP contract because we will supply this address to the RP requester. And we also need to name uh, the ERC721 contract, uh, give it a name. So let's just name it demo day and token can also be demo day. So this is hello. Okay, some yeah, I just I, I just heard something. So yeah, uh, we had the ERC seven two one. We are going to call it demo day, and the, also the token tag will also be the demo day. So this is the tag you see when you uh, when on Ether scan. So now that we have a constructor defined, I can go ahead and define, basically we need to define three functions to do a QRNG call. Um, the first function is the set parameter function. So set request parameter, let's say that. And this function takes the address of the air node, um, the endpoint ID, and the address of the sponsor wallet. And it takes those functions and this will only be called by the owner because we don't want anyone else to change these parameters and this function will basically take these arguments and set them for these variables so pretty simple function and node will be underscore air node um, endpoint id will be underscore endpoint id and Sponsor wallet will be underscore sponsor wallet. Right? So, this is a very basic function that if you plan on using QRNG, you should have this function. It will make things a lot simpler. So, now that you have these three parameters set, all you need to do is now define your, uh, basically, you need to define your a QRNG request function and then QRNG fulfillment function. So in the QRNG request function, what we're going to do is we're going to request a random character. So this function, let's just comment here. This is my QRNG request function. And I will also need a QRNG fulfill function. So I need two functions. So for my request function, I'm going to request uh, a random character. And I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to give it a variable of name. And this is going to be a public. And it would return to me that bytes 32, which is the request ID itself. 
So the bytes 32 is the request ID is a bytes 32 type. And when I call this function, I will get back that request ID. So uh, what do we do in this function? Basically, we are going to call air node RRP and we're going to call this and tell it that I am making a request to so and so air node. Uh, please uh, give me back a response. So that's what's called the air node request response protocol. Uh, it basically accepts a request and then sends it to the air node and the air node uh, processes that request, calls the API, gets the result back, sends it back to air node RRP, then air node RRP sends it back to our fulfill function. So that's how the sequence of operation goes. So to call air node RRP, what we're going to do is we're going to first uh, have a request ID and we're going to say air node RRP dot make full request. Because air node RRP dot make full request would return to me a request ID, which we return back um, uh, to this to the person calling request random character. So what does make full request need? Uh, it needs a bunch of arguments. Uh, particularly, it needs the air node address, which we specified here. It needs the endpoint ID. It needs the sponsor. And the sponsor is um, the contract itself. So we're just going to do address this. The sponsor wallet. So that's also something we specify. Uh, specified here. And we also need the fulfillment address. So where will this request be fulfilled? So it's also going to be fulfilled here. So address this. And we also need the fulfillment function. So where is this, uh, in this address, which function should we call to fulfill this, uh, request? So we don't have that function defined yet. So let's define it. Uh, let's call it function. Um, let's just call it a mint character. And it's going to be uh, bytes 32. It's going to take a request ID and a bytes call data data. So every fulfillment function should look like this. Uh, this is this is like a standard fulfillment function. Uh, you should not change this this fulfillment function uh, template before. And so yeah, this is our fulfillment fu function. And we take this um, function and we are going to call it here. We're going to specify it here. So the way to specify it is this dot min character dot selector and finally we can specify parameters extra parameters that we want to pass we don't want to pass any extra parameters so we just leave it as black so that's it when this function executes it will call a node rp dot make full request with these with these arguments and give us back a request ID. Now this request ID, we are, we wanted to um, sort of use it and uh, set our mappings here that we have. So these two mappings. So we're gonna set expecting this and give it the request ID and we want it to be true. And the request um, the request to requester request ID and we want to set it to message dot center. So this request ID is now tied to the person calling this message and it's also waiting to be fulfilled. 
So yeah, that's it for this thing. We can also return the request ID. So because this is expecting to return the batch 32, which is request ID. So now that we have our request random character function defined, we need now we can now define the min character. Uh, we know that this function will be called when there is a random number in data. So we already know that there's going to be a random number in data. So with that assumption in mind, we can now start defining this function. Uh, what we can do is first thing we want to check is is the request ID awaiting fulfillment? So we do require um, expecting request ID to be fulfilled. Request ID. We want this to be true. So if this is not true, we say request not awaiting fulfillment. Basically, this request has already been fulfilled. We can't do it again. Um, once that's done, uh, we go in and and we basically set it to false. Um, so that once this has been fulfilled, we we just set it to false. You int 256, we define our random number that we have uh, from data. So what we do is we have to decode the data itself. And the way to do that is abi.decode data. And within data, we know that there is a u in 256. So this is how you do it. So you do abi.decode, it takes two arguments, the actual thing that you want to decode and what type it is. So we know that data is a u in 256 type. So this is how we get back the random number. Now that we have the random number, we can sort of use it to uh, create our character that we defined here, the struct. So let um, id let the ID be, let the ID be characters dot length. So this is like, like we, whenever, whenever we create a new character, it, uh, we sort of increment the ID and let the strength of this character be equal to random number percentage. Um, so this is mo modulus of uh, of the random number. So say we want a random number between zero and thousand. So we do random number modulus thousand, which will give us a random number between zero and zero. So. We have our, we have that random number, and then what we can do is we can do it going to six intelligence. We can do that as a random number between um, hundred and fifty. So say you want a random number between hundred and fifty, uh, you do random number uh, modulus hundred, and then you add fifty to it. And so that gives you a random number between 100 and 50. Um, okay. Um, let's. Now that we have these attributes defined, what we can do is we can actually push, push this. Um, character to that array so what we do is we do characters dot push and this character that we have with the strength intelligence and 
Oh, we have one thing missing actually. Uh, we also need the name where name isn't defined. So what we can do is we can since the name we we do it while calling while requesting a run printer we pass in the name. So we also need to set the name for every request ID. So what we can do is we can add another mapping. Um, of bytes 32 to string and that would be the request to uh, name. So each request that we do will be tied to a name. Um, so again we go back here and we do request To name and that will get the request ID and we set it to the name that we want. Perfect. So and then we push that here to this array. So that will be request to name uh, request ID. So the since characters is expecting strength, intelligence, and name, we we create an object of the struct, and then we push that object to this array. So now we have sort of this this character created and pushed into this array, and now we can go ahead and mint the actual MS2 itself. So we call safe mint and the receiver is defined in this mapping. So request to sender, uh, request to requester, request ID and the ID of the NFT would be the new ID. The to this is the token ID of the NFT. Yeah, and that should be it for our mint character function. And the request is done. The set request parameter is done. So overall, our our contract is basically done. We just need to add one function to view our character itself, and that's a pretty small function. So it's like function view character stats and we give it the token id and it's a public new and it returns so it returns to us the stats of the NFT. So let's just return characters token ID dot strength characters token ID dot intelligence. So that's it. Our contract is basically done. Um, I don't think I have missed anything. Let me just double check. Uh, I missed the license. So you need the license here. So this is fine. Yeah. Okay. So going back, let's try and compile this. Hmm. In line 33, I apparently missed something. Oh, oh, I don't know why I put comma here. These are supposed to have some points. Line for the 
let's see. Oh, supposed to move turn this. One sixty five. Is this any column? And the type of. Okay. Now that all those small things have been fixed, we can go ahead and deploy this and test it out. So I can go ahead to my uh, deployment deployment environment and change it to Injected Web3. Uh, I'm currently on the Polygon network, but you can use it on multiple chains. So if you go to our QRNG docs um, and you see the chains, these are all the chains that you can deploy on. So there are a lot of chains you can deploy on. Um, for now, I'll be deploying on Polygon. I'll go to the contract, I'll check the random character, and I'll input my internet RP address. So for Polygon, that will be this address. So I'll take this. And this will be the, basically the, the argument to the constructor right here. So this argument, and I'm going to input it. Uh, you can get it from the chains tab in our docs. Uh, it defines all of the Node RP addresses. So for Polygon, it's this one. Take this, I put it here, click on transact. I get a MetaMask pop up and I click confirm. Uh, sometimes on Polygon, you get this transaction enterprise. However, uh, what you can do is you can a mask and click on aggressive and that will sort of fix that error. Um, so our contract is deployed. You can go here. These are all the functions that we can interact with. First thing you want to do is you want to set the request parameters. Uh, so I'll open that up. The air node address. So to get the air node address what I'll do is I'll go to the API providers tab and I'll copy this address. So I'll copy that and I'll paste it here. For the endpoint ID, I'll copy this endpoint ID. You can see that there are two endpoint IDs. Um, each endpoint ID basically, uh, this endpoint ID is for a single random number and this endpoint ID is for multiple random numbers. So if you need multiple random numbers, you will choose this endpoint ID. But if you need a single random number, you'll choose this endpoint ID. So I'll copy this endpoint ID because I just need a single random number. And then I'll go here and I'll paste this in. Next, I need a sponsor wallet. Now, sponsor wallets are things you derive uh, based on the address of the contract. So to do that, what you need to do is you need to go over to our docs. Go to search and type sponsor. Uh, no, no, sorry. And type derive sponsor wallet. So derive a sponsor wallet. You go here. Um, use the admin CLA. So this one, right? So this is how you draw a sponsor wallet. You basically run this command and you supply in these parameters. You supply the air node xpub, you supply the air node address, and you supply the sponsor address. The sponsor address is uh, the address of our contract. So all we need then is the air node and the xpub, both of which you can find in the um, chains. Uh, in the API providers tab for QRNG. So this is the XPub and this is the end. So now we have everything we need. We can just run this one. Out. So we take this, we copy, we go to 
we open a terminal, get bash terminal. Um, we didn't get bash, I don't know if you can see this. We paste this in. Um, sorry. So, yeah. For the N or XPUB, we we take the address from here, N or XPUB, copy it, and paste it in. For the N or address, we take the address from here, paste it in. For the sponsor address, this is the address of our contract. We take the address from our remix here. We copy this, paste it in, and we run this. Okay, uh, sponsor wallet address is this. So we just take this and we copy it. We come back to this and we paste it in. We can transact. Uh, again, the transaction. Okay, looks like uh, that one was successful. So now we have set the request parameters. Uh, before we call the mint function, you need to do. You need to just keep one thing in mind. You need to send funds to the sponsor wallet. So you um, call, take the address of the sponsor wallet and send it some funds. Not a lot, like zero point two or zero point one is not sufficient. Um, so you send it. Actually, I'll just send it to a bunch of Because sometimes, right now, like when the transactions get underpriced, we want to send a little bit more funds. Okay, so you send it, send the sponsor wallet 0 0.1 Matic. And now what you can do is. You can actually go ahead and call the random character. So we need to give it a name. So let me give it Ryan and let me call it. Okay. Successful. Ooh. So let's see it in ether scan. Still being added to the scan. Well, while this is ongoing, I can sort of show showcase uh, an example project that I used to build something more complex. Uh, it's called Quantum Mons. And they are the world's first quantum NFTs uh, that use AI and uh, QRNG to mint uh, quantum monsters. And uh, these, this was a very fun project to sh sort of showcase how quantum mons, uh, how QRNG can help build new and exciting use cases. Uh, people have already begun minting. Uh, quantum mons. Uh, I can already see on OpenSea we have a, a bunch of like 25 already minted. So it looks like uh, people have already put prices on this, which is <laughs> insane. But it's only been like uh, an hour or two hours since I've uh, officially launched it. And uh, it's nice to see that uh, you know, QRNG being used uh, in the live production app. Um, okay, let's see. I'll post guides on how to use quantum, uh, on how I made quantum ones. 
and uh, if you are interested uh, feel free to check out check it out so very cool to show it's alive <laughs> so let's see if we have our fulfillment done So we go here. So we request it to this contract. Okay. So a good way to check if your fulfillment transaction is done is to monitor the sponsor wallet. And the sponsor wallet is this one. So you take this, copy it. Go to here and check, and it's still in the process of getting fulfilled spending, so it should be done soon. Uh, once it's done, we have basically created a comment in the contract that uses true energy. Nice job, Ashar. It's, uh, it's not too easy to do that as, I guess, calmly as you just did. So, uh, thanks, dude. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm happy to help if anyone has any uh, questions or needs any help on Discord later. I, uh, they can DM me and I can help them and sort of set it up. <sighs> Looks like the fulfillment. Sometimes Polygon does this where, like, the fulfillment takes like ages. That's not good. We wanted to use Polygon or another chain like Binance. Yeah, I mean, you can use a lot of chains, but sometimes with Polygon, what happens is you saw that like, I got, I was getting those network enterprise errors on MetaMask, right? Um, yeah. Polygon tends to have these spikes uh, where the gas price just goes insanely high. And all of these yeah. RP RPCs stop working. I just joined, so I don't really know what we're doing here, but I get the sense that Polygon can get clogged pretty easily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so once this has been fulfilled, basically we, we've, we've minted our NFT, then once the fulfillment transaction is complete. And, uh, yeah, the, the workshop was basically me describing about how you can write your own uh, smart contract that uses Q QRNG to mint NFTs. And we're with that, I think we are done. Uh, I don't know when this fulfillment will happen. It should happen quickly, but right now Polygon is acting up. So. I do have a question. Uh, I've been thinking about using mint QRNG. I'm wondering, can I make it work between a fungible token and an NFT? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, what you're describing is the ERC-7, ERC-115 standard? Uh, uh, I have no idea. I know that 721 is a standard, 115 is also not ours. Yeah, so ERC-1155 um, is a standard that, that you can create both non-fungible and fungible tokens. So like, the idea that I had was, um, can I make it so that in order to, I guess, you or like have an NFT be active, let's say it's like a game game card or something, mm -hmm. it's got random properties from QRNG and whatnot. In mm -hmm. order to use it, I have to use a fungible token to activate it or something like that. But also the fungible token has its own random parameters. Supply is changing, mint rate is changing, deflationary burn is changing, like everything is random about it. Can that can that interoperability work with this standard of EIP it, one one five five? So what you're describing? Do you want it to change? How often do you want it to change, or, or is it like one time? Like it, it's going to change. Um, well, I mean, when an NFT gets made, its properties will no longer change, but the fungible token will continue to have random properties. Right. But in order to use the NFT, I want to be able to use 
um, or lock or burn, some, somehow interact with the fungible token. So is that dependent on QRNG at all? Because I just saw in Polygon, there's like ridiculous, you know, fulfillment times. It's going to mm-hmm. take a few blocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it takes uh, 20. Yeah, so now we've like fulfilled it now. Okay. Uh, and we've minted the demo day NFT. Uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, so what you're describing is, um, is using that NFT in your fungible token, uh, and being, oh. it, having QRNG influence the aspects of the fungible token. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So essentially there's a fungible token supply and then the NFT in order to even be used, burned, minted, or I mean, not minted, minting is independent, but in order to like use the NFT or I guess burn it, um, to do some, what is it called, play to earn stuff or whatever. Just think of it as like a game. So mm-hmm. NFT is a currency, but you need a fungible to currency to use the non-fungible currency or whatever. Is, is that dependent on QRNG's like fulfillment times? I guess what I'm asking, like to do this on Polygon, It'd probably take like, so, I don't know, five minutes or so, right? Not necessarily. When it's fast, it takes like two minutes. Okay. On average, it takes like four minutes. To answer your question, uh, it really depends on what you want to use. Like, in the case that QRNG, right here, I'm just using it to mint the NFT. But once it's minted, right, like, you don't need QRNG anymore. Um, but say you want to use QRNG in your fungible token. And you want to have it periodically set certain values using QRNG within the fungible token itself. Uh, that would require running a keeper along with QRNG. Uh, the mm-hmm. keeper would sort of make requests to the fungible uh, tokens function. And the fulfillment mm-hmm. function would then, uh, you know, set the parameters within the fungible token, if that makes sense. Hello? Oh, I said I see. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so once NFT is minted, its properties cannot be changed? Yes. Okay, gotcha. So there's no, there's nothing you can do with like a NFT that requires a certain like amount of a fungible token to work with it. It's set at its creation. Okay, that's pretty cool. No, actually, right. that you can uh, sort of modify within the token oh. itself. Uh, okay. That's that's what I sort of did in uh, Quantum Mom. Is um, I can I can sort of change the URL to which it is pointing. And, uh, uh, that makes it a bit flexible as to like where you like want this NFT to point to. Because NFTs, people usually view them as like the set in stone things, but you can actually yeah. do a lot of cool things with them. Uh, you can think of them more as a, a token that is issued by someone rather than a, a thing that is set in stone. So, so, so an idea here is that, um, can there be an NFT that points to different image URLs depending on the number of fungible tokens you have? Yes. So let's say, for example, oh, oh, it's, it's completely possible. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, that's fun. That's cool. <laughs> so I think, Ben, that's the end of the session. I think we've already minted our, oh, actually, I didn't show the stats that I got via QNG. So if I type in the character stats, if I type in zero token ID, so these are the random numbers I got, 291 and 41. Well, thanks to those that have joined. Um, Any questions, feel free to drop them into the stage chat or the general chat um, and Shah's around okay. well not 24-7 but he's around <laughs> yep no, no I'm around 24-7 <laughs> alright yeah, I feeling. All right, see you guys <laughs> bye bye bye